think we are live. Good evening, folks. Lee Hayward here, creator of the Muscle After 40 Blueprint Program and the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. Welcome to our video chat today for Friday, February the 2nd. Another Friday, another live video Q&A going live at 5. All right, hopefully this is coming through loud and clear on your end. Seems to be working fine on mine. I just want to make sure that it is coming through on yours. And I'm going to give it a moment now for a few people to pop onto our live stream. <clears throat> we have AJ joining in. Hello, AJ. Glad to have you. As you pop on, please let me know, first off, if this is coming through loud and clear on your end. And also let me know if you're tuning in live. If you are watching this live as I'm doing it, post a lot, hashtag live down in the comments below. I just want to kind of get an idea there. And if you're catching up on the replay afterwards, which I know a lot of people do, then post a hashtag replay down there in the comments. Just kind of give me an idea who's joining us live, who's joining the replays afterwards. Awesome. We have Mike is joining in. Good to be here. Glad to have you, Mike. Welcome. We have Orville joining in live. Welcome. Mike and live. Yes. Alex is live. Good stuff. Hey, how's it going? Glad to have you joining in. Excellent. All right. I'm just going to let a few more people pop onto our live stream right now. So we are streaming simultaneously from the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page, as well as the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. So wherever you are joining in from, be it Facebook or YouTube, uh, you, you'll be able to participate in our live stream here this evening. On YouTube, it's going to be a video chat window to the side of the video. On Facebook, it's probably going to be the comments below the video, but either one is fine because it all comes through on my end here. Got a lot of people popping onto our stream here. Let's see who else is joining in. JTZR1 from, okay, it's Jeff from India, Indian Trail, North Carolina. Okay, I've never been there, but welcome. Glad to have you joining in, Jeff. I don't, I can't say I recall that name as a regular. I mean, maybe you've watched these videos before, but is this your first time tuning into a live? If it is, let me know if this is your first time tuning into a live chat. So I do recognize some of the regulars. If Crispin is a regular of our chat, come through loud and clear. And I know Alex is a regular, so thanks for doing it. You're welcome. Glad to have you joining in. We have Ray joining in from the UK, or sorry, Steve Ray joining in from the UK. Good evening over there. Awesome. We have Richards joining in from Iowa. Welcome. Glad to have you joining in. We got Bruce joining in, picking up the kids from school. Excellent. Nice to have you joining in as well. Good stuff. So for those of you who are brand new to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat and you're wondering what the heck is all this about... This is basically an opportunity to just kind of hang out for the next hour and shoot the breeze when it comes to topics of fitness and nutrition, health, wellness, any specific challenges you may have when it comes to building muscle, losing fat, and getting in your personal best shape. Feel free to type those questions and topics of discussion into our chat window or into the comments section below, wherever you're tuning in from. <clears throat> you can type it into the comments there, and I'll do the best I can to help you out over the course of our video chat today. And again, anything goes, diet related, supplement related, workout related. And if I can help you, then I will. Like I've been around the fitness industry for well over 30 years now, and this is my passion in life. This is what I do. I've been an online fitness coach since 1997 and helping people with their health and wellness, fitness and fat loss goals. So if I can help you out, I will certainly do so over the course of our video chat here today. And if I can't help you, then I'll try and point you in the right direction to somebody who can. Because even though I've been doing this for over 30 years, I don't claim to be a know-it-all. Right? I, there's still a lot of stuff that I'm learning, still a lot of stuff that's uh, outside my scope of expertise. So if I can't help you with a particular challenge that you're going through, I'll probably be able to hook you up with somebody who can. Because I have a large network of friends and colleagues in the fitness industry. So if there's something that I can't help you with, I could probably point you in the right direction or to some resources that could help you. All right, so again, got a lot of people popping onto our live stream here and some questions coming through. Uh, one that I want to address, uh, I actually posted this up on our Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook group. Uh, I posted this a while back asking for people to send in questions in advance for our Q&As. So there were several people did that, and I'm just going to address some of those questions here. 
while I'm waiting for you guys to post in your questions and topics into the chat window. So let's see, we had uh, Steve as a regular says, do you have any tips on managing muscle soreness? He says, it blows my mind. You can train legs to maintain such huge legs and still go on big bike rides. I have a hard time at work doing my job, especially with a sore back. All right, it's tips on managing soreness. And he's referring to me personally there when he says the, the big bike rides, because that's one of my uh, passions and sports now that I do. I, I do a lot of uh, recreational cycling, and I even do some of local cycling races in our area and sportif and group rides and things like that. In fact, last year I hit a personal best when it came to cycling. I rode 13,500 kilometers last year. So that was a personal best year for me. And, you know, so Steve is just wondering, on managing muscle soreness. And this is something that will get better the more you train. The more, the, the more you train, the more your work capacity builds up, the more your stamina builds up, the more you're going to be able to handle the higher volume and the workload and the less soreness you're going to experience. So people who tend to get the most soreness are people who are new to the gym. So, for example, we're here we are. It's, it's the beginning of February. So we just went through the, the New Year's resolution boom, right, where everyone's feeling fat and guilty after the holidays. And they said, you know what? I'm going to join the gym. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to lose all this holiday weight gain. That's it. I'm going to right, come hell or high water. I'm getting in shape. And then they go and they just do too much too soon, overkill. And they end up just feeling painfully sore because they're, they're doing way more than their body is, is accustomed to. And that's usually when you get the most soreness is when you're doing more than your body is accustomed to. So the best way to deal with muscle soreness is to progress slowly. Start off small, start off at a very manageable pace and then build it up day by day, week by week in a progressive overload fashion. Now, I know that sounds so basic and intellectually, of course, it makes sense. But when it comes time for application, sometimes common sense is like a fart in the wind. It just goes out the window. And we always have this more is better mindset, this you know, go big or go home. And if you're not training hard enough, and if it doesn't hurt, then it's not working. That's not the case, especially when someone is just starting off. And this is something that I, I do when I'm working with people one-on-one -on -one in the gym. Like when I'm working with new coaching students, especially, and taking them through workouts in the gym. I, I like that when I'm there with them one-on-one, -on -one, because I can control it. You know, I can control how heavy they go, how hard they push themselves. And a lot of times when they're new to their workout routines, as soon as they start to struggle and I can see like they're starting to grit and grind and struggle, I say, stop. There's no need of that, right? W once you're starting to struggle, you've already stimulated the muscle, right? There's no need to go push into failure and beyond. Like, in fact, once you start to struggle and your form breaks down, technically you've already hit muscular failure because the true definition of failure is when you get to the point where you can't complete another repetition with good form by yourself, right? It's not the point at which you can't move the weight at all. And I'll give you a prime example. Like think of a bicep curl. When you can no longer do a strict bicep curl with control uh, by yourself with good form, and now you have to heave or swing or cheat or use momentum to get the weight up, you're already past failure. Failure is the point where you can't do another strict form by yourself with good form. If you have to start using momentum and swinging and heaving and all that to get the weight up, you're already surpassed failure. So there's really no point in going beyond that, especially in the early phases. You know, as you get more advanced, there's a time and a place to use control cheating and, and some of these more advanced techniques to take your, uh, you know, to stimulate muscle growth to failure and beyond because the body can adapt and handle to that workload. But for someone who's starting off, conservative, err on the conservative side and focus on the consistency. So that's a big one for muscle soreness is just don't push yourself too deep in your sets. Like as soon as you, as soon as your form starts to break down, stop the set. Right? There's no need to go beyond that. And if you want to get some extra volume beyond it, then I would much rather you do an extra set than push into using sloppy form and forced reps and negatives and cheating and all that kind of stuff. I would much rather you do more volume or even better, more consistency. Right? Uh, live to lift another day. That's another line I like to use. Like, okay, you don't have to destroy yourself today, but have a consistent routine where you're getting into the gym on a regular basis and building that habit and the consistency. And it's the consistency, which is going to lead to the results. And it's also going to build up your work capacity and build up your strength and your stamina and allow your body to progress without 
risking injury and beating yourself up in a single session. So that's a big one for sure. Another one that's really important when it comes to minimizing muscle soreness is post-workout nutrition and intra-workout nutrition in general, like workout nutrition, basically fueling your, your workouts. So making sure that you have a good meal before you go to the gym so that you have some energy to run on and you have some protein and nutrients in your system that you can utilize for recovery and growth. Post-workout, same thing. And then consistently throughout the day with your meals, making sure that you're meeting your protein intakes. Big one. Like a lot of times people are falling short, especially when it comes to protein. And the general rule of thumb is a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight per day. That's a good benchmark to shoot for. So to put some numbers there, if you want to weigh 200 pounds, just using that, like whether you're you're skinny and you want to bulk up to 200 pounds, you want to, you're like, let's just say you're 175 pounds and your ultimate goal is you'd like to weigh 200 pounds. Well, you would strive for 200 grams of protein per day. Vice versa, if you're 230 pounds and you would like to drop down to 200, strive for 200 grams of protein a day. Strive for a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight per day. And that will provide uh, the raw materials that your body needs for muscle growth and recovery and help to minimize soreness. Because if you don't provide the fuel and the nourishment, uh, your body's not going to re recover optimally. All right. So that's another big one for sure. And um, other things that can help as well after your workouts, stretching out the muscles that you just trained can help to minimize soreness. Uh, I, this is a, something that I do personally, and I actually posted a live video clip to our Facebook group uh, just recently, the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook group. I've showed my post-workout stretching routine. If you're if you're on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding group, you'll probably be able to see it, or you can go search through the media tab to find it. Uh, if you're not, you can just head on over to Facebook, search for Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding, request to join the group, and I can add you as a member to our group. But in there, there's a a video clip where I literally took you through an entire post-workout stretching routine that I do. And this is not only good from a recovery point of view and minimizing muscle soreness, but it also minimizes the risk of injury and it aids with muscle growth. Stretching is such a neglected aspect of fitness for a lot of people, but it can make you recover better and it can make you more mobile, uh, more flexible, reduce your risk of injury, and it can actually help with your strength gains as well. So I'm a big advocate of stretching and that's a good thing to do to help minimize muscle soreness after a workout so like those those are a few strategies i mean we could go on and on because we, we could go deeper down the rabbit hole but those are some of the big ones that i would focus on for now all right so that was a question again from steve that he posted this up on the facebook group uh let's see what else we got there was another question there it was a good one that i wanted to address there's so many questions that come through i mean there's, there's no way i'm going to answer them all but i try my best to answer some of the top ones for sure <clears throat> let's see here um where was it? it was from brian if i'm not mistaken posted this uh just a second i lost my place here yes brian asked he says you talk a lot about strength training but i'm curious do you have thoughts or a list of the best cardio exercises to do i do straight cardio on an elliptical but that can get boring yeah, for sure. Cardio is a very underrated form of exercise. Um, and there's something that I, I find is a pet peeve of mine is so many fitness gurus these days, they downplay cardio. Oh, you can get shredded without doing cardio. No boring cardio. And they try and sell people on what they want to hear. Like they always try and make cardio sound like this nasty, ugly, boring thing and that it's bad and you don't want to do it. And they, all you want to do is high intensity strength training, right? I mean, when you look at it, <laughs> saying cardio is boring and then that strength training is exciting. If, if that's the case, you just haven't found the right cardio. I mean, I agree. Spinning your wheels on a treadmill or on an elliptical machine in the gym can get boring. But so can just picking weights up and putting them back down again. <laughs> that can get pretty boring as well. If you want to have fun with your cardio, get outside and enjoy it. And this is something that I'm a huge advocate of. And that's one of the reasons why I've really gotten into cycling in recent years. I mean, I get, gotten more serious into it, I should say, because I've always cycled. Ever since I was a kid and learned how to ride a bike, I've been riding a bike and I never stopped. But over the last several years, I've gone down the cycling rabbit hole, if you will, and gotten a lot more serious with it and even competing in local races and events. 
but that is so much fun because you're outside you're in nature you're you can explore and there's you can have like group rides and have the camaraderie and it's not just spinning your wheels on a treadmill staring at the wall or staring at the clock or or whatever like you're outside and actually going on an adventure and the way i do my cardio now it's so much fun i would do it even if it wasn't good exercise and prime example like how many people do you know go ride motorcycles or go out riding atvs or dirt bikes or things like that because it's fun to do i mean it's not good exercise but it's fun to do well the same thing that's why i go out bike riding because it's fun to do except i'm the motor <laughs> so i'm also getting exercise from it as well so if, if you're struggling and, oh, cardio is boring, I don't like cardio, you haven't found the right one. Like there's get outside walking and hiking. Cycling is great. Snowshoeing, skiing. There's so many things that you can do that are, it's so much fun. And the big thing is just get outside and, and make an adventure out of it versus just thinking that cardio has to be done on a treadmill or on a, an elliptical or in a stationary bike in the gym, staring at the clock and counting down the minutes. Like, yeah, that can get pretty boring. With that being said, I still do a fair bit of indoor cardio as well, especially if the weather is not conducive to getting outside. But you can make that more interesting as well, right? Like you can go for, uh, with cardio, there's a lot of group sessions, especially like at your local gym, there may be spin classes or different types of structured cardio sessions that you can do. Uh, you can even piggyback it with watching some of your favorite shows. Like uh, I know when I was getting ready for bodybuilding shows and, and doing a lot of cardio on a daily basis, I used to get into watching movies or if, if you're watching, like maybe there's a series on Netflix that you're into and something like that, set up a cardio machine in front of your television <laughs> and, and watch it that way. So you can binge watch Netflix as much as you want, as long as you're doing cardio while, while watching it. I mean, that's a great way to kind of get your guilty pleasure of binge watching your favorite shows while also getting some cardio and making it fun in the process. Like there's all kinds of ways around it. You just got to get creative and thinking outside the box, right? But uh, again, cardio is such an underrated form of exercise, and it is a critical one. And the way I like to look at like strength training, cardio, flexibility, they're all like legs of a tripod. You can't say like which one is more important than the other. Uh, like some people try and say, well, strength training is more important than cardio sucks. Or strength training is more important and you don't worry about flexibility or mobility. Or, or then you get the endurance guy say, well, cardio is king and strength training sucks. And then all the other, like every mix mash. They're all important. Every one of them is important. It's like the legs of a tripod. It's almost like, well, look at your own legs. Like, what's more important, your right leg or your left leg? Hey, we're going to chop one of them off. Which one do you want to keep? Like, I'd like to keep both of them. Right? Both are equally important. That's the same as when it comes to fitness. Strength training, cardio, flexibility and mobility, they're all equally important. Right? You, you can't say that one takes priority over another. They are all pieces of the puzzle and they all need to be in there. Because if you have one without the other, it's totally incomplete. Like uh, prime example, like you think of like in the, in the bodybuilding world, for example, like there's a lot of guys who are big and strong and muscular and that, and they don't have good cardiovascular health. And then they die of a heart attack. Then on the other extreme, you might have somebody who's in really good cardiovascular health, but they don't have the muscular strength or the bone density that comes from strength training. And then maybe you do have good strength and good cardiovascular uh, stamina, but if you don't have good flexibility and mobility, you're very injury prone. So like they're all, each one, again, it's like the legs of a tripod. You can't say one is more important than the other. You have to implement them all into a, a good structured routine. And this is one of the things that we focus on within our advanced muscle after 40 blueprint program is we come up with a unique strategy of how you can combine your strength training, your cardio and your flexibility and mobility and do so in a way that you can enjoy and sustain. All right, let's see what else we got there. Uh, so those are a couple of questions that came through on the Facebook group, but I'm just going to jump back in here because I know there's a lot more people posting up questions here on our live stream and I want to give you guys the respect you deserve for joining in live here as well. I might have, something went wrong there. I don't know what the heck happened. Like something bumped me out of my my uh, my screen here. <laughs> Hopefully this is back. <laughs> Jeez whiz. That's, like what the hell just happened here? 
right? I was on, I was online talking and just gone. Hopefully, okay, you're back. You're back. You blanked. Okay, everyone, <laughs> I'm alive and well. It's just some shit happened on the computer. I don't know. The computer glitched out on me, but we're back. All right. Ah, where was I? That's good. I was I was afraid I was going to lose all this just then. Uh, Alex got a question. Are Romanian deadlifts a good replacement for back extractions? I think he means back extensions. Uh, I'm looking to add some low back and hamstring work. Romanian deadlifts are an awesome ex exercise for the lower <laughs> lower back, glutes, and the hamstrings. Uh, that whole posterior chain. Excellent exercise. It's a similar movement to a back extension slash hyperextension, similar movement pattern, but it feels different. Right. So it's I'm not saying one is better or worse or right or wrong or whatever. I, I incorporate both. But if you don't have a, a back extension slash hyperextension machine, uh, you can certainly do Romanian deadlifts or you could also do good mornings. That's another similar movement pattern. Uh, you could do that instead. But I would. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a hit or miss. Like is is having a back extension machine a must have piece of equipment? No. But it's a nice to have piece of equipment. I do use it on a regular basis. Like we have a couple of them at our gym. We've got a 45 degree angle hyperextension and we've got the rogue uh, glute ham raise uh, hyperextension bench, the big meaty one. And I, I like both of them. And both of them feel totally different, even though they're both back hyperextensions. Uh, one gives it a totally different contraction than the other. I find when you're doing the the, the rogue uh, glute ham raise machine, it's, it focuses more on the peak contraction. You really got to fight to hold yourself up in that top position, whereas the 45 degree angle hyperextension really gives you a good stretch in that bottom position. So one is more peak contraction oriented, one's more stretch oriented. I, I very often superset them and alternate them back to back. So I'll do a set of the 45 degree angle, set of the the horizontal one and do them alternate set for set. Probably do a couple sets of each. And I find that that really hits the lower back, the glutes, the hamstrings well. But uh, I'll also include good mornings and Romanian deadlifts and different exercises like that as well. You know, kind of mix and match it in throughout the workout routine. And the way I may do it, like I might do a few weeks of focusing primarily on the, the hyper extensions. And then I might do a few weeks focusing primarily on Romanian deadlifts. Then I might do a few weeks focusing primarily on good mornings or something like that. And then kind of like cycle them over time. And you don't have to do every exercise, you know, every single workout. You can kind of go through phases. And this is a great way to keep the workouts fun and interesting and also to prevent those plateaus because you're changing up the movement patterns and changing up the variety as you're going. So, you know, it is a, a great exercise to do and one that I certainly incorporate in as part of my workouts. We have Brian joining in from Tampa. This is his first live. Welcome, Brian. Glad to have you joining in. And Brian, if I'm not mistaken, Brian K just came on board with our Muscle After 40 VIP coaching program. If it's the same Brian K that I'm thinking of, welcome. Glad to have you joining in live. He would believe he went through our Lose Your Gut Challenge group that we had a couple weeks ago over on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook group and then came on board with our Advanced VIP group. Welcome. Glad to have you joining us. And JTZR1 says, I watched a few live chats, watched all the videos of your Camaro and your trip on Route 66. Oh, those those are way back. Those are back in the, uh, that was 2011. Those videos were posted up. Well, that's cool. So you've been a longtime follower. Awesome. Glad to have you joining in. We have Frank joining in. Welcome, Frank. We have JKS50. For chest workouts, I've been doing flat bench only for all exercises and chest flies on pec deck instead of doing a balancing act with dumbbells, hoping it gives shoulders a bit of a break. What are your thoughts? Um, well, something's better than nothing. So the fact that you're doing chest workouts at all, <laughs> whether it's a flat bench or an incline bench, you're doing something. So that's good. However, I would recommend incorporating some incline bench work, especially if your shoulders are causing issues. As weird as it is, I find an incline bench less stressful on the shoulder joint than a flat bench. Even though you think, okay, I'm doing it on an incline, there's more upper chest, shouldn't there be more shoulder engagement? 
I just find this now again, this is me personally, everyone's unique. So I'm, this may or may not apply to you, but I find with myself and a lot of the people that I coach, if, if you have shoulder problems, like with flat bench presses or flat bench flies, elevating the bench. And, you know, if you can probably like a 30 degree incline, if it's an adjustable one, if you got to use the 45 degree incline, that, that works fine as well. But I find the incline press, the incline fly, it just takes some of the, it, it's easier on the shoulder joint and there's less risk of stressing the shoulders. Another reason could be as well is you're naturally going to lift a little lighter when you do an incline because it's a, it is a weaker movement pattern. When you're, when you're on incline, you're weaker. When you're on a flat, you tend to be stronger. And then on a decline, you tend to be strongest for, for most people. Now, it could vary from person to person, but that's generally the strength curve when it comes to uh, a chest press movement. Weakest on the incline, strongest on the flat, or weakest on the incline, stronger on the flat, and strongest on the decline. But I, I would recommend, if you can, do some incline chest work and just see how it feels. And if you have access to an incline bench, then that should be no problem. And even if you have to, sometimes you might be able to rig up a way to prop up the end of your bench. Like if, say, you're training at a home gym and you don't have a proper incline bench, you probably could get uh, like a wooden box or a wooden platform of some sort to kind of prop up the end of the bench and do it that way. I've, I used to do that when I was training out of a home gym. And, you know, you, you can get creative and make it work, right? And obviously, whatever setup you use, test it and make sure it's solid. But there's ways around this, right? If you don't have a proper incline bench, you can kind of make one do. And I find that that is a great uh, variation, not only for stimulating new growth in the chest, but it might also take some of the stress off the shoulders as well, if that is an issue, which it sounds like it is based on your question there. But uh, another one, too, you can experiment with uh, if, if you want to add some extra variety, push-ups. Push-ups are a great substitute for bench presses slash chest presses. It's one of the most underrated exercises. And in fact, for a lot of my in-the-gym coaching students that I'm working with now, um, we're doing push-ups now in place of bench presses and chest presses. And they're getting better results, like more muscle activation, actually feeling more muscle soreness afterwards from doing push-ups versus doing bench presses and chest presses. And anytime you move your entire body through space, there's a higher level of neuromuscular activation. So for example, like if you do a push-up versus a bench press, there's more activation when you're moving your entire body through the push-up. Same if you're doing a dip versus a bench press, same idea. A pull-up versus a pull-down, more activation with the pull-up. A squat versus a leg press, same idea again. There's more activation with the squat. So Anytime you can get those body weight movements where you're moving your entire body through space, that's a great way to really uh, uh, increase the neuromuscular activation. And if needed, you could add resistance to your push-ups, whether it's like a, a weighted vest, uh, partner-assisted push-ups, um, rubber resistance bands. Like you can put a rubber resistance band around your shoulders and, and do extra weight that way. But uh, again, push-ups are phenomenal chest exercise. It's, I remember back before I got involved with structured weight training. I used to do a lot of body weight exercises such as push-ups when I was doing martial arts. And that kind of really gave my chest a head start over my other muscle groups because years of doing high repetition push-ups uh, really helped to, you know, just fill out my, my chest and add, add a lot of mass there over the years. But yeah, uh, let's see what else we got there. Uh, Alex got a question. So they used to eat eggs for breakfast regularly. However, they recently started to bother me. I tried to find a substitute, but most high protein breakfast foods are high processed or carb loaded. Um, you, you don't have to have, I mean, eggs kind of, it's like a traditional breakfast food. And, you know, I very often have eggs for breakfast. In fact, I had eggs for breakfast this morning. It's just, it fits in there because it's kind of a traditional thing, but there's nothing stopping you from having chicken or steak or, you know, other protein foods for breakfast as well. Like one of my top coaching students, Mike Brown, like he very often has, uh, has beef for breakfast. Like he'll cook up, uh, you know, beef as, as part of his regular breakfast or chicken, something like that. Like it doesn't always have to be eggs. And another thing you could try too, like see what is it about the eggs that are bothering you? Like, Maybe you could consume egg whites instead of whole eggs and just see if that 
is the same issue or not. And if it is just eggs in general causing some digestive issues for you, then yeah, I mean, you could swap it out. Another one that I like as well is just very quick and convenient, high protein oatmeal. Like mix up a big bowl of oatmeal, throw in a scoop of protein powder, stir it in. And it's a great way to get some, some carbohydrates and get some uh, protein in there as well. Blender smoothies are really convenient for breakfast. And, you know, you can mix up like fruit and berries and, and uh, protein powder and mix it up into a smoothie. Um, if, if you want, you can even toss in some like spinach and, to get some extra greens. And that's a great way to get a very nutrient dense, easy breakfast that's uh, high in protein. So there's a lot of ways to go about it. It doesn't always have to be eggs for breakfast, you know, and it doesn't always have to be cereal and toast either, right? Like I know when I was a kid growing up, that was that was always breakfast, right? I was cereal and toast and a glass of juice, right? Just just carb load the shit out of yourself, right? That's all we did, right? When I was growing up, and I, and I know so many people do the same thing, right? Cereal and toast, or coffee in a bagel, or coffee in a bun, or a muffin, or something. You know, it doesn't always have to be a carb breakfast. You can have a high protein breakfast and it can be meat. It can be protein powder. It can be blender smoothies. There's, there's all kinds of variations, right? You, know, like you could have, you know, a normal dinner meal for a breakfast, just the same as you could have a breakfast for a dinner meal. Like you don't have to follow the, the traditional rules of, you know, has to be cereal and toast for breakfast and has to be a sandwich for lunch and then has to be meat and potatoes for dinner. Oh, you could have meat and potatoes for breakfast. Right? You could make it work. Uh, let's see what else we got there. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, what are your thoughts on baking soda as a pre-workout? I have sort of used it. And the theory behind baking soda, like I, I've, I've tried it in small amounts. and But uh, I can't really say it's been advantageous or negative, but I have tried it. But the idea behind baking soda is it can kind of serve as like a lactic acid buffer and it should allow you to train and not get so much lactic acid buildup in the muscles and not as much uh, fatigue. So it should help you to train longer in theory. Some people swear by it. Some people say it's a eh, hit or miss. I haven't really pushed the limits of it. I've kind of dabbled with it a little bit and it didn't hinder my workouts right? But at the same time, I can't really say it made a huge difference. One thing that I do take as a pre-workout or intra-workout, and I find makes a big difference, is sodium in general, like salt. I will literally put salt in my water bottles. Uh, sometimes I'll even make sure to have extra salt with my pre-workout meal, because I'm a, a high salt sweater. <laughs> when I sweat, I sweat out a lot of electrolytes and I sweat out a lot of sodium. Like if I'm wearing a black t-shirt and I soak it with sweat afterwards and then when it dries, the t-shirt is, you could see the white salt stains in the black t-shirt, right? So I have a high sweat rate, a high sodium sweat rate, I should say. And this is individual, like everyone's salt sweat rate is going to vary, but I know I have a high one because I, I do sweat out a lot and I need to replenish that sodium. So that's one thing that I do pre-workout, intra-workout, and it makes a huge difference. And if I don't have extra salt, especially when I'm doing a hard training session or a long training session, I will feel the fatigue, I'll feel muscle cramps, uh, and I just won't have optimal performance. Like electrolytes, especially sodium, which is the, the king of electrolytes, is critical for the muscles to function properly, to contract, uh, for you to have adequate hydration. I mean, there's so many benefits to it. And, and this old school of thought, oh, salt is bad for you. Salt's going to raise your blood pressure and all that. It, it's all relative. And the, the, the old school like blanket statement, oh, everybody just cut their salt. That's not factoring in like how much salt you're losing. I mean, if you look at someone who's sedentary and they're not sweating, they're not drinking a lot of water, they're not physically active. Well, if, if they consume a lot of sodium, then there's there's no way for the body to really excrete it. And it's, it's, it's overkill. It's no need of it. But if you take uh, an athlete who's training hard, sweating a lot, drinking a lot of fluid, and flushing sodium through their system at a higher rate, they need to replenish that sodium that they're that they're losing, right? So you you just can't use the blanket statement saying, "Oh, salt is bad. Everybody got to stop consuming salt." No, it depends on the individual and their situation. So in my situation, where I am a high sodium sweater, and I do drink a lot of water and I do sweat a lot, I 
I'm slamming back sodium. The generally, the more the better. So in this situation, baking soda is also high in sodium. So that could serve as a another source of sodium, as well as the the side benefit of the being a lactic acid buffer as well. Like a lot of endurance athletes uh, will will use this more so than than bodybuilders. But um, it's it's certainly worth trying. I mean, it's it's cheap. <laughs> like so, it's not like it's going to break the bank. Uh, the only thing you might want to be concerned with is if you start off small, the smaller, the better, like, like just a, the tip of a teaspoon at first, you know, and see how that works and then try a little more and a little more and just gradually build it up ever so small. Uh, but don't go boatloading, like don't chow down like a big heaping tablespoon full of baking soda because it'll probably cause gas and bloating or, or stomach irritation, you know, it might cause you to have to, you know, have the runs or something mid workout, right? You know, like it, it could cause if, if you're not used to it and you start doing something crazy, uh, it, it may cause all kinds of, you know, stomach issues. Let's just say that. So if you are going to try it, start off small and then build it up and just see how your body tolerates. So that's what I've done. I've, I've started off small, but again, I'm still in the small phase that I haven't really, I can't say I've noticed any benefits or negatives from it as of yet. Um, but that's something like you can Google search it and just kind of, you know, you might find some more feedback and real world results, but chances are it's going to parallel a lot with, a, a lot with what I've just said. Neil's joining in. Neil's a regular to our chats. He says, how do you bust plateaus for isolation exercises? I mean, why is it harder to increase weights each week on a bicep curl, lateral raise and a cable fly, etc.? Great question. Um, the reason it's it's not that you're necessarily hitting a plateau or you're doing anything wrong, it's percentages. There's a big difference between adding five pounds to a twenty pound dumbbell curl, between and adding five pounds to a two hundred pound squat. Percentage wise, it's huge. It's a ten x difference, and that's why it's often harder to make strength gains in small isolation exercises. Uh, so like, for example, when you're doing dumbbell curls, let's just say, uh, keep the number simple, you're, you're curling a 20 pound dumbbell and you say, okay, I want to have progressive overload. I want to go to the 25s. You just increased your weight by 25%, right? That's like someone who's bench pressing 200 pounds and saying, okay, I want to make some, I want to increase my weight. I'm going to go to 250. I'm going to slap 50 extra pounds on, on the barbell and, and hope for the best. That, that That's a massive jump. And chances are, if, if you're going to get stapled to the bench, like if, if you're struggling with 200 pounds and you say, okay, I'm going to try a little more and you slap on an extra 50, you know, you're going to get stapled to the bench with that barbell. So it's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just percentage wise, it's so much harder to increase the weights on small isolation exercises. What I would recommend, um, th there's a couple ways to look at it. And from a progressive overload standpoint, I'll start with this one first. Instead of trying to increase the weight, focus on working within a repetition range. So let's just say you're doing three sets of 10 for bicep curls. Next workout, try and get 11 reps, you know, and build it up to three sets of 11 reps. Once you can do that, then try go 12, three sets of 12, and then three sets of 13 and 14 and 15. and Build it up, like probably build it up to 15 or more repetitions, like get a good barrier of reps there. And then once you're doing high reps, then you can increase to the next heaviest set of dumbbells and then drop the reps back down and then start that cycle again. So instead of always adding weight each workout or each week, you're adding, trying to add a rep each week. And that's a great way to progress with the smaller isolation exercises. Uh, another thing we got to factor in as well, it is a small isolation exercise. So if you start increasing weight and reps, a lot of times you'll start bringing in other muscle groups to assist. Like with the bicep curl, you're going to start to heave and swing and cheat. Same with the lateral raise. You're going to start to use a little bit of leg drive and, and swinging to get the weight up. And if you have to cheat and use momentum, you're, you're taken away from the, the isolation aspect of the movement. So for me, I'll very often keep the same weights with isolation exercises and just focusing on feeling the muscles work. And if I want to make it harder, like I'm feeling extra strong and the weights are feeling a little light today, I'll slow down my tempo. 
I'll hold that peak contraction for an extra second at the top. I'll slow down the negative, right? I'll really, I'll make that lighter weight feel heavier by working it, you know, like stricter form, slower tempo, squeezing, contracting the muscle and getting the most out of that exercise with the set weight. And then when it gets to the point where it feels easy and like, I know I can lift more like this, this is just too easy. Then I'll go to the next heaviest set of weights. But a lot of times I'm using very close to the same weights on a lot of the small isolation exercises. I'm totally cool with that. Like I'm, they're not ones that I try to increase week after week after week because I know if I do, uh, my form is going to go to crap and I'm probably going to risk injury in the process. But the bigger exercises, you know, your squats and your leg presses and your chest presses and your deadlifts and stuff like that. Yeah, you can increase the weights on those because adding five pounds to a, you know, again, a 200 pound squat is a lot different than adding five pounds to a 20 pound dumbbell curl. Right? So it, percentage wise, it works out in your favor. Another strategy you can use here as well is you can get the fractional weight plates. Um, we don't have them at the gym that I train at now. At the old gym that I trained at, they did have some. But you can even pick them up yourself. Like you can go on Amazon or, or online and just search for fractional weight plates. And you can actually order some yourself. And they're mini plates. So they might be like you can get them in. I don't know exactly how small they go, but like you could probably get like a half a pound plate. So if you wanted to go up by one pound, you literally just put a half a pound plate on each side of the barbell or or the dumbbells. You can even get them as, as magnetic plates as well. They're a little bit more expensive, because, but really convenient and ideal for dumbbell exercises. So if you wanted to increase the dumbbell by a pound or half a pound or whatever, just get a couple of the small magnetic plates, stick on each end of the dumbbell. And it's a great way to uh, make these fractional increments in weight instead of trying to go from you know, a five pound jump, which is huge, you could hopefully make a one pound jump or even smaller, depending on how small the fractional plates are. But you can go on Amazon or, you know, any sporting goods site and you should be able to find them. Just start Google searching fractional weight plates and you'll, you'll find those. But that'll make it easier if you are trying to train with progressive overload with isolation movements. But um, what you're experiencing, it's that's normal for everybody. You're not alone with that. Yeah, I, I bet if, if I did a survey of everybody watching this video chat now, people are going to agree it's harder to make strength gains with isolation exercises versus compound exercises for those very reasons I just explained. All right, let's move on. I'm going to have a sip of water. Let's see what else we got there. We have Wellesley joining in. Hi, Lee. Wellsy here from the UK. Keep up the good work. Fist pump. Thank you, my friend. Much appreciated. Um, uh, Richard saying, I ride and it can become a workout if you break down, run out of gas or drop the bike. Just saying. <laughs> okay, he's referring to when I was saying about motorcycles, hence the avatar picture there of him on a motorcycle. Yeah, if you break down, run out of gas and you got to, uh, you know, Hike, hike a bike to the next gas station. That's definitely a workout. Or if you drop a bike, you know, I've done that before. Uh, and there, there is a way to pick up a big motorcycle. I had to learn that the hard way. I, I, I used to have a gold wing back in the day. That was my motorcycle. And those are big motorcycles. And I did drop it. Now, luckily, never heard it because it just went down on the crash bars. But thankfully, I had watched YouTube videos explaining how to pick up a big motorcycle. And you just don't pick it up like you pick up a bicycle. You actually got to turn around, get your ass up against it, and almost like hack squat it up. It's totally different, all right? If, if, for those of you who are motorcyclists, if you don't know how to pick up a big bike, you'll have to do a search for uh, YouTube videos to show you how to do it. But it's uh, there's, there's an art and a science to picking up a big motorcycle when it tips, tips over. All right, moving on. What else we got there? We have Khalid joining in. Hey, coach, glad to see you. Glad to see you as well. Glad you're joining in. Uh, who else we have here? We have Drum and Bass Mixes Golden Era from the UK. How are you doing? Glad to have you joining in. Uh, have you ever used the Scott Press for shoulders? Scott Press, Scott Press. I'm trying to think. Is that, I have to do, it's, it's a variation of a dumbbell press, if I'm not mistaken. Like some of these 
all exercise. Like people make up their names. Obviously, it's from Larry Scott. I'm just going to do. A, I will tell you one thing. It's not a staple exercise in my workouts, but uh, uh, how is this Scott Press? Is that the one? Yeah. Okay. No, I. I. I that's not. I've done the. Um, the Arnold press back in the day, which is basically just uh, like twisting and alternating the dumbbells. Uh, as far as the Scott press, no, I, I've ne it's not a staple. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing these different press variations if you want to. I, for those, I, I just had to do a quick Google search to refresh my mind with the Scott press. There's nothing wrong with doing these if you want to. I mean, it's it's just a, another variation of you know the core exercise, but. You can do a basic shoulder press and still make great progress with it. It still can train in a progressive overload fashion, make all the, you know, stimulate the muscles, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you do between barbells and dumbbells and machines, like you can hit a lot of different angles with the shoulder press. Um, right? I just haven't personally gotten into the Scott press myself. Now, who knows? I'm, I may, when, when I hit a plateau with my current shoulder press variations and I want to change it up, I might give it a go. But as of now, no, it's not been a staple in my workouts. If it's been a staple in yours, let me know. Let us know down in the comments. All right, how, how's it working for you? Uh, Thomas is joining in. Uh, so some of the best trainers on YouTube claim to be natural, but the advice they give is very good. The best trainers on YouTube are 99% honest, but people knock them for that 1% dishonesty. Um, I know a lot of people do get into the whole natty or not and all this kind of stuff, and... <sighs> For, for the greater scheme of things, like take it with a grain of salt. And you know, the biggest reason why this is, is because in North America anyway, like it's, it's not the same in all countries. Cause in some countries, uh, like drugs such as anabolic steroids and performance enhancing drugs are not classified as they're not criminalized, illegal what's class. What, what's the class of drugs they're under? I can't remember the uh, anyway, but it's, it's a, it's a, basically if you're caught using anabolic steroids in the United States, like that is a criminal offense. You can go to jail for it. So why is anybody going to go on the internet and start saying, Hey, I take X, Y, and Z, uh, because <laughs> you're admitting that you're breaking the law and you're, you know, you're opening the door to getting your ass sent to jail. I mean, I've known people personally who've literally served time for performance enhancing drugs, right? So that's why a lot of people will claim to be natural, even if they're not, is because they're just covering their ass. Like, let's just say you did recreational drugs. Are you going to go on your Facebook and your social media and tell everybody, hey, I'm getting high every weekend on such and such a thing, or I'm I'm whatever. Like, no, you'd be an effing idiot to do that, right? I mean, you're being an effing idiot to do it anyway, but you'd be a double effing idiot to then start smearing it all over social media, saying that you're taking illegal drugs and, you know, have the police knocking down your door ready to arrest you because you just openly admitted you're committing a crime. So that's the biggest reason why it's not as out in the open as it should be, right? I mean, if, if it was decriminalized, I think the whole view on this would change dramatically. But the fact that it is a criminal offense in some countries, it's not all countries. Some countries is totally legal to have it. Uh, other countries are kind of in this gray area where it's legal to have it for personal use, but illegal to sell it or whatever. I mean, it, it, you'll have to look up the laws in your own particular country, wherever that happens to be. But I think that's the biggest reason why you hear all this, the controversy of it, you know, it's, it's because of the, the, the legal status of it and people just don't want to get themselves in trouble. Right. So I, I think that's the biggest issue right there. But as far as training and nutrition advice, um, you can still follow good training advice from somebody regardless if they are enhanced or natural. And from a true bodybuilding perspective, the, the core principles do not change. Like the, tr the, the workouts for an enhanced lifter versus a natural lifter are very similar. The diet for an enhanced versus natural is very similar. The only difference is the enhanced lifter is going to get better results from the effort they put in. Like things are just going to work better. 
they're going to have the the recovery. They may be able to push themselves a little harder before they overtrain. You know, like it's it's just going to work a little better, right? That's that's what it is. But the core principles still apply. It's still the same. It's almost like if you have a race car and you're running it on regular fuel versus high octane race fuel. The principles of driving the car are the same. Like a good driver who can drive a race car on uh, regular race fuel and say regular street tires is going to be a great driver if he's using high performance, high octane race fuel and uh, sticky race tires. Like the, the same principles apply. The same mechanics apply. It's just someone who has better fuel and better tires uh, is going to have a better advantage, right? But the same core principles apply. It's not like there's one way to drive a race car uh, with race fuel and sticky tires, and there's another way to drive it with regular fuel and regular tires. The, the same principles apply in both situations. The same applies when it comes to uh, fitness training and bodybuilding training or whatever, or sports training in general. It's just if you have better tools, if you will, you'll get better results. But the same core principles apply. So you know, you can still follow the advice for the most part, but just in the back of your mind, take it with a grain of salt, especially, I'll give you a prime example. Like you look at Arnold back in the day saying, oh, I used to work out six days a week, four or five hours a day. Well, if you're, if you're a natural, you're probably not going to be able to recover from six days a week, five hours a day in the gym, right? Even if you're on every performance enhancing drug out there, you're probably not going to be able to stick to that for very long before you burn out and overtrain. But you know, take some of that raw, raw piss and vinegar with a grain of salt, but the core principles of training and nutrition and, and all that stuff, it applies regardless, right? It's just the people who are enhanced are going to get better results from the efforts than the people who are not. But yeah, in, interesting question. And, and that's that's my opinion on it. I just think it's the reason why there's so much dishonesty so to speak is because of the legality issues i mean if a, if you could go into gnc or, or any supplement store and buy it just the same as your creatine and your protein people would talk about it as openly as they do creatine and protein right i, I honestly think that would be the case but because it's not then that's why people are hush hush about it right? and i think that's the big reason for this you know so, some people like throw caution to the wind and they don't care they'll talk about anything but yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's it's opening up a can of worms, in my opinion. <laughs> anyway, moving on. TS says, I'm bigger than last time I posted. Who would have guessed getting stronger and lean bulking would work? I'm, I'm, I'm sure he means lean bulking there. Good for you. Uh, if, if you're bigger and stronger and getting lean and all that, Kudos. <laughs> please share. What are you doing? How's it working for you? Obviously, it's working well, but please share. But kudos to you. Uh, we have Khalid saying, my question is, is it okay if I work chest today and then next day, can I work shoulders or will it affect my recovery? You could, but chest and shoulders there there's overlapping muscles because when you train your chest you're bringing in your shoulders as secondary muscles so they're going to be pre-fatigued now it's not saying that you can't do it or it won't work right you, you probably could but just factor that in um what a lot of people do is if they're going to pair up body parts they'll pair up complementary muscle groups for example a push pull legs a very common bodybuilding split where you're pairing up complementary muscle groups so chest shoulders triceps is typically classified as your pushing muscles because when you do chest you're bringing in your shoulders and triceps as assistant muscles when you train shoulders same thing the triceps and even to a degree the chest is coming in as assistant muscles when you're training triceps chest and shoulders coming in as assistant muscles so pairing all those muscles together and then giving all those muscles the same recovery time before training them again usually works the best. Usually, right? Now, but there's always exceptions to the rule. But if you are going to pair them up or, or include like a chest day and a shoulder day, because maybe just let's just say uh, shoulders is a stubborn body part for you and you want to give it some extra workload, I would probably space it out more so that there's a couple days of recovery in between. You know, like train your chest Monday, train your shoulders on Thursday or something like that, you know, just space it out and then work some non-competing muscle groups in between, 
maybe like your legs or your back or something like that. That's would probably be a better alternative than to pair up chest and shoulders back to back because by the time you're training your shoulders, they're already still pretty fatigued and still recovering from the chest workout that you did the day before. Right. So that's, that's my two cents on it. Right. But again, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can split this up. I mean, I, I know, even though I said that there's probably somebody out there saying, well, I train chest and then the next day I train shoulders and I'm huge and it works. And if it works, wonderful. <laughs> you know, keep doing what you're doing. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But for most people, I, I would follow the advice that I just gave you there. I'd split them up. Uh, let's see this. What would a couple lifts for lower pecs? What would a couple lifts for lower pecs? Do you mean like what are a couple exercises for lower pecs? I guess that's what you mean. Um, anything that you, requires a decline bench, it would generally hit the lower chest. Now, l let me back up. Anytime you train your chest, you're hitting your entire chest. Like it's impossible to isolate upper chest, middle chest, lower chest. Like anytime you squeeze and flex, the chest comes into play. Like all the chest muscles are coming into play. It's just that an incline tends to place more emphasis on the upper, but you're still hitting the lower and the middle. A flat tends to be more of the middle, but you're still hitting upper and lower. And a decline tends to be more lower, but you're still hitting middle and upper. Like it's still all contracting. It's just where are you contracting more of the workload? So inclines upper, flat is middle, decline is lower. That's the, the general rule of thumb. So just switching to a decline bench for for chest presses or flies or things like that would work more lower chest. Um, there's a couple things uh, and other ways you can do it as well. Like, like dumbbell flies uh, on a decline bench, especially if you're lifting heavy weight, is a very awkward exercise. Uh, like, I, I don't mind doing decline presses with like a barbell in a proper decline bench press. But to get in position with dumbbells and then to get back onto that decline bench and to do a setup for a dumbbell fly can be pretty darn awkward. Like it's awkward enough to get in position for an incline or a flat, but then when you actually have to go back and down is really awkward unless you have a couple of training partners to hand the weights to you. So I rarely do decline dumbbell flies. If I want to hit that decline position for a fly, uh, I'll usually use a cable crossover. So from the high pulley cable, the cable crossover, which would mimic the same body position and motion as you would get with a decline fly. So instead of doing a, a decline dumbbell fly, I'd probably do a, a cable crossover fly from the high pulley cable to mimic the same movement pattern, but it's a hell of a lot easier to get in position. That, that's what I found was the, the awkward part is just getting set up, especially as the weights get heavier, right? It's, it's hard to get into that position and then vice versa to get back out of it again, because now you're literally doing a decline sit up in a fatigue state with the added weight of whatever you were lifting for your, your, your exercise. So you know, unless you have a training partner to hand you the weights and take them away from you at the end, uh, it's it's really hard to do it by yourself. So just something to keep in mind there. Robert saying that a 30 degree incline is easier for him. And that's fine. A lot of people do find a, a lower incline uh, optimal. Like in the, in the gym, we typically there's, you got the flat bench, then there's a 45 degree angle incline bench most of the time. Uh, but then if you have the adjustable ones where you can put them in the middle, um, in the middle, like uh, like Robert mentioned, 30 degree very often works well for a lot of people. You know, it's more emphasis on that upper chest and probably a little less strain on the shoulders. But again, that's that will vary from person to person and depending on your, your own mobility and body mechanics and all that as well. Jason's joining us. Jason's a regular. So I started using cluster sets in my multi-joint heavy exercises most of the time when I can't reach the target number of reps in a regular strict set. Is that a good idea? You can certainly, I mean, there's, there's nothing, there's no real rules when it comes to strength training. Like a lot of times people think, well, you have to do, you know, follow the rules and the, and the workout has to look good on paper and, you know, it just has to stimulate muscle growth and, when when we're going through all this, like everything works, everything works, but nothing's going to work forever. 
So like you could follow any type of training program as long as you're consistent with it is going to work. But eventually your body is going to adapt to that training program and it's eventually going to hit a plateau. And once that happens, then you need to kind of change it up. And this is where it can get interesting. And there's all kinds of ways to change it up. If you want to change up your set and rep pattern like you're doing, that's fine. I mean, if, if it's providing unique muscle stimulation, you're enjoying it, you're getting progress with it, keep doing it. Like my opinion <laughs> isn't going to change that. It, it really depends on you and your personal preferences and, and what you enjoy doing. All right. Like prime example, like I enjoy doing total body workouts most of the time. Like I'm, I'm kind of switched now. I am lately I've been doing an upper lower body split, but for, for years I've been doing total body. And I, I enjoyed it and I made really good progress with total body. Now I'm just changing it up a little bit. I'm doing kind of like upper lower. But still, I, I find that works really well for me and I enjoy it. Now, there's other people out there who swear by body part splits, you know, where you have to have one major muscle group per day. Uh, for me, that doesn't, I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that anymore because I'm not in the gym frequently enough to get the uh, the consistency and, and the muscle frequency from one major muscle group per day. I like to train multiple muscle groups per day or total body so that I can get more frequency. And I find that shorter, more frequent workouts works better for me. Now, someone else may be the complete opposite. They may like a longer, more infrequent workout, right? It's, it's not right, wrong, good or bad. It's like, hey, if it's working for you, you're making progress with it, you're enjoying it, do it, right? Like there, there's one person in particular, I'm not going to mention names, but he's always messaging me like, what do you think of this workout split? And what do you think of that workout split? And, and, you know, like, what do you think of push pull legs? And what do you think of, you know, upper lower? And what do you think of this split? And what do you think of a bro split? And like, what I think doesn't mean jack shit. Like, try it. Do you enjoy it? Is it working for you? <laughs> right? Like they all work. That's what I'm getting at. Like, it's not the workout split. Right? There's not some magic workout split. There's not some magic set and rep pattern. Like, It's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It's all the other little nitty gritty things. It's you know your consistency, your nutrition, uh, you know your sleep habits, your lifestyle habits. All these other things play a much bigger role in the greater picture, in the greater scheme of things than your workout split or your set and rep pattern, or, Hey, I like to do three sets of 10. And someone else says, well, I like to do five sets of five. And someone else likes to do four sets of 15. Like who gives a shit what you do? And as long as you're, you're training in a progressive overload fashion and you're consistent and it's working for you, then do it. <laughs> right. But uh, have the flexibility to realize that every program eventually is going to adapt and plateau so like this is the the process of training this is when you start a new workout program this is generally what happens you start something new and your body's not accustomed to it so in the process of just doing it your body has to adapt it has to adapt to this new training stimulus as you're adapting guess what happens you start to grow from it you get bigger you get stronger you start to see progress so you do something that's totally awkward totally unfamiliar and you keep doing it, your body adapts. And the next thing you know, whoa, I'm stronger. I'm better at that movement. I'm better at that exercise. I'm getting stronger. I'm seeing gains. And then you keep riding that wave of momentum. I mean, it could be several weeks. Who knows? But you're, you'll keep doing it week after week after week. I'm getting stronger, getting stronger, getting better, getting better. And then it's going to start to, to tip into a plateau where now you're not making the same strength gains anymore. And you're probably even struggling to match what you previously did. Or your strength is starting to even regress. So like just to throw some numbers out there, let's just say you were doing a, a, a leg press and you were whatever, you were lifting 400 pounds on the leg press for sets of 10. And now all of a sudden you're struggling to get seven or eight reps with that same weight. And he's like, what the heck's going on? Right. It seems like I'm losing strength. What, what's happening? It, you're plateauing. Your body is, you know, you've adapted, you've grown. Now you're starting to plateau. And this is where you probably want to change it up. Either change up the set and rep pattern, change up the exercise, change up the split you're doing, change something. I mean, maybe you need to go through a temporary deload phase where you literally back off the, the volume and the intensity for a little while, go through like an active recovery phase for a week or two, and then start building it back up again. But once you go through it and you're aware that your progress is plateauing, don't just keep beating your head against the wall, hoping that it's eventually going to get better again. I'll just keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, right? And just keep beating your head against the wall. No, like be aware that this is happening and then change your approach. 
And that's kind of what I did with my own workouts. Like I was following the total body workouts. Now I still had a lot of variety built in there, but it was starting to go stale and I wanted to try something different. So then I switched to the upper lower split. And if you want to see the program that I'm following, it's actually the upper lower body rotational split. There's a playlist up on the total fitness bodybuilding YouTube channel. That's the program I'm following right now. And I've been starting to see fresh gains again, which is fun, right? Starting to see some new progress because it's unique muscle stimulation and the body's going through that adapt and grow phase. So I'm still in the early adapt and grow phase, but I know eventually it's going to plateau when it does. I'll try I'll change it up and try something else. So getting back to Jason's question here with the cluster sets and your multi-joint heavy exercises, if, if it's working for you, you're enjoying it, you're seeing progress with it, keep doing it, but be aware of it that once it starts to get stale, you feel like your progress is hitting a plateau and that's just not the same anymore. Change it up and do something different and, and be open to doing that. Right. And I, I should also elaborate on this. Just, like every now and then you're going to have a bad day. And just because you have a bad day or a low energy day doesn't mean you have to scrap your workout and immediately change it. Like the, we're all, our energy levels are going to fluctuate. Like some mornings you're going to wake up with full of piss and vinegar and have energy and you're going to hop out of bed and say, woohoo, I can't wait to start the day. Other days you're going to roll out of bed and you're going to be yawning and slam the alarm clock and say like, oh, I don't feel like getting out of bed today. Just the same as some days you, you wake up full of energy and other days you feel tired. Same applies when you go to the gym. Some days you're going to be full of energy. Some days you're going to be tired and everything in between. So just because you have an off day occasionally doesn't mean your program has hit a plateau and you can't make progress with it. It might be just you're extra tired. Or you slept like shit the night before or whatever. So look at the trend. If you have several bad workouts in a row and you can kind of see the trend where hey, this just ain't working the same as it once was. And the, it's starting to plateau or even regress. And it's it's not just a one-time thing, but it's you know a consistent theme happening. Be aware of it and then change your approach, right? But just don't, oh, I had a bad day today. I got to scrap my workout and do something totally different. No, I mean, it could be just you had a bad day or a bad night's sleep or you're under stress at work or whatever. Like could, there's any reason why your energy and, and strength could fluctuate. It doesn't mean that you've actually hit a plateau. So just want to clarify that. Cause I know probably someone will blow that out of proportion and see as soon as they, as soon as they have a bad workout, they think they'll need to scrap their, their training program, but it's, it's not the case. Eddie's joining in says, Lee, I was told to stay away from salt after I had a bypass. Well, I'm not going to tell you to disrespect what your doctor says, but pay attention to your sodium uh, needs, right? Like stay away from salt. You, you First off, you need salt, even after a bypass surgery, like salt is essential. If you were to just say like zero sodium in your diet, your body would not function. Like sodium is essential. We need sodium. It's a key electrolyte for the body to function. Uh, if, if you have zero sodium, you will not function, right? You, you, you literally die. <laughs> you can die with zero sodium. And there have been cases where people have died because of lack of sodium. It's usually an extreme endurance type of events, but you, you need some sodium. But the thing is, you need to match your sodium to your, your needs. I'm assuming if you've just had a bypass surgery, you're probably not pushing yourself super hard in the gym. You're probably not sweating a lot you're probably um, unless this was years ago when you're fully recovered and you're back to normal training and I, again i don't know how how far along you are in your your rehab or your recovery from this but you have to match your sodium intake to your needs and, and one of the biggest complaints is uh, i hear from a lot of people is they just think salt is bad and they keep avoiding salt and then if you're feeling muscle cramps as a regular part of the gym, like you train and then all, especially like in your calves or maybe in your abs or you're just training and all of a sudden you find your muscles just lock up and, and get that Charlie horse cramp and it happens frequently. And especially if you're sweating a lot, right? That's a sure sign that you're losing sodium, you're losing electrolytes and you're not replenishing them. So if you're continuing to have cramps on a regular basis, you probably want to bump up your sodium intake a bit. And it doesn't have to be crazy. Like it doesn't have to be like, oh, I eat no salt and now I'm chewing on salt cubes or I'm, you know, pounding back salt meat and salt fish and salt pork and you know, eating salt out of the salt shaker. Like, no, it's not, <laughs> you don't have to drink soy sauce out of the bottle. <laughs> like a few shakes over your food. Like, you know, it could be as simple as that. 
And another thing we got to consider, like most people's sodium intake doesn't come from the salt shaker. It comes from all the processed food they eat. So if you cut out most processed foods, especially the ultra processed foods, you know, canned foods and boxed foods and packaged foods and salty chips and salty crackers and snacks and breads and all this, if you eliminate or greatly reduce those foods, your sodium intake greatly goes down as well. So in my case, where I don't eat a whole lot of ultra processed food, I purposely had to add a little bit of salt from the salt shaker to make up for it. Whereas if I was eating processed food, I probably wouldn't need to because I'd be getting adequate sodium just from the food. So the, the salt shaker is a very small percentage of our salt intake, even though a lot of people say, well, I don't use salt and think they're eating a low sodium diet. But when you factor in all the, the processed stuff, you know, there's a probably a ton of sodium in the foods you're eating. So like natural fruits and vegetables and lean proteins and on processed foods, like there's no added sodium to them. They're very low in sodium. So very often we actually have to add it to, to compensate and make sure we're getting the electrolytes and the sodium that we need. But again, it's going to relate to your own individual needs, right? Just the same as I can't prescribe a one size fits all caloric intake need, like say, okay, this person is an office worker. They don't go to the gym. They don't exercise. They sit at a desk all day and they drive back and forth to work in their car. So there's very little activity. And then we have someone else who's works out two hours a day in the gym, plus they do cardio and they have a physically demanding job. And then trying to say that both these people need the same amount of calories. No, <laughs> the, the person who's active, exercising, has a physically demanding job, he may be burning three times as many calories as a person who's sitting on their ass doing a, a desk job and is inactive. So same applies with sodium intake. Like that person probably needs three times the amount of sodium as someone who's sitting on their ass and is sedentary. So you can't like use these, everybody has to stay away from salt it's, or it's bad. Right? It depends on the individual and their individual needs, right? So you know, I'm, I'm just kind of trying to give you a bigger picture of this. But again, talk to your doctor about it. So like if, if you are active and you're sweating and you're finding you're still having muscle cramps and low energy and stuff like that, you know, or your muscles feel flat and depleted, even though, you know, you're not dieting or you're not on some maybe you need more sodium because sodium helps to pull water and nutrients into muscle cells to help to volumize the cells and help you to get a better pump, have more strength and energy, right? Like if you don't have enough salt, sometimes your muscles will feel flat and depleted, uh, not from lack of carbohydrates, but just lack of electrolytes and lack of fluid volume and nutrients being pulled into the cells. So there's this, this is a, there's a lot we can go down the rabbit hole with. I'm not going to spend too much more time on it because I, but hopefully this just gives you a better understanding. It's, not the bad guy. <laughs> uh, where else are we? Let's move on. I know there's a shit ton of questions still here to go. Um, Mark is joining in. Welcome, Mark. Uh, respect from London to the family, mate. Glad to have you join in, Mark. Mark's a regular. He says, I just hit 100 kg on the bench for 25 reps with no carbs. I want 50 reps, man. Holy crap. First off, um, 25 reps with 100 kilograms. That's that's insane. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, and on a low carb diet as well. Interesting. You know, kudos to you. It's obviously working. <laughs> uh, City is joining in. Always nice to see you live. Welcome. Glad to have you joining in. Uh, I'll be going to the gym to start your single limb training program. Cool. Awesome. And that is actually one of the playlists. If you're interested in checking it out, go to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. There is a single limb workout playlist, and this is good if you have imbalances between like one side of the body is bigger and stronger than the other, which most people have an imbalance. Uh, virtually everybody has some imbalance between the left and right sides, but for some, it may be more, more of an imbalance than for others. So if you want to create more balance and symmetry and proportion between the left and right sides, single limb training can certainly help to... Uh, balance that out. It may never be perfect, but it could help to improve the, the symmetry between the left and right sides. Neil saying, thank you much. Have a great weekend. I will. And uh, you too, my friend. Um, we have N. Plea S. E. Dad. <laughs> Dear Lee, you're truly the man. Well, thank you much. I know I butchered your name, but thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Uh, we have Think Money. 
Um, Lee, have you always been natty or not? <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest. When I was younger, I have dabbled with different things in the past, right? When it came to, uh, like, when the pro hormones were out, I dabbled with those, um, stuff like that. But I've never, I've always prioritized my health. I also dabbled with certain fat burners like ephedrine and uh, clenbuterol and things that would be uh, considered not natty. Um, but one thing that I have done, um, every time I have competed in any type of sport or drug tested event or something, I always follow the rules because I said, I'm not going, like, I remember I was competing in a powerlifting competition back in the day. It was a drug tested powerlifting meet and they didn't even want you to use ephedrine or anything like that. So I didn't use anything that would be on the banned substance list. So I made sure of that. But when I was competing in bodybuilding, like I have done uh, back in the day when pro hormones were popular, which are now classified as a, an anabolic, um, I did dabble with those when they were available. Different types of fat burners, like again, Fedrin did that. Um, Clenbuterol, I even tried that for a while. I hated it. I, I dabbled with it, but it was just way too strong for me. So I went back to a Fedrin, which not as strong, but not as many side effects either. So but that was the big thing. But I've always been on the conservative side with that. Like, I'm not going to say I've been squeaky clean and I own, my only substance I've ever consumed was creatine and protein. I'm not going to go that far. But I've never went down the rabbit hole of, you know, the, the nasty stuff, if you will. <laughs> right. You know, because I always looking at this from the bigger picture, health and fitness. That's the ultimate goal. And yes, you know, you, you could take some stuff that may give you an edge or better, better gains or something in the short term, but at what costs, right? Like at what costs in the long term? And I'm always weighing that in, in the back of my mind. That's what I'm always thinking of. And I was like, I would rather have subpar fitness performance, but live a long, healthy life than have maximum fitness performance and not live a long, healthy life. Right. So that's that's my personal preference. I know everybody to each their own. And I'm not saying that someone is right, wrong, good or bad for whatever choice they make. It's your own decision. You know, assuming you're you know, doing so legally and ethically and all that stuff. Uh, but that's just just my take on it. Uh, let's see what else we got. Steve is joining in, says, I ca can I bulk and see results from a kettlebell routine? Three days a week, like hypertrophy, something you would do with dumbbells, but instead using kettlebell. <sighs> Something's better than nothing, all right? Like, I, I'm, I'm going to just share my personal opinion. Like, kettlebells, they do serve a purpose. There are certain exercises that I find are, are nice to do with kettlebells. But it's just a glorified dumbbell. Like if I had a choice of having a full set of kettlebells or a full set of dumbbells, I'd take the full set of dumbbells any day. Like if, if I was stocking up a gym, be it a home gym or a commercial gym, and I was on a budget and had the, okay, you can choose either or I'd go with dumbbells over kettlebells any day. Like there's nothing magical about a freaking kettlebell, right? I know this kind of has this cult following and there's all these like kettlebell certifications and people doing all these weird, wacky kettlebell exercises, but in, in my opinion, a, a dumbbell is much more functional piece of equipment and you can do a lot more exercises with it. And I, I just, I would much rather do a dumbbell routine than a kettlebell routine. Now you could still get away and, and do a lot of similar exercises, but some of them are just going to be down very awkward or uncomfortable. Like I was watching one guy at the gym the other day, he was trying to do kettlebell bench presses and the way he was holding up the kettlebells and wobbling and shaking. I'm like, why? Like, Frank, just grab a couple dumbbells. Like, you'd be a lot more solid and stable and be able to lift heavier and probably stimulate way more muscle growth with less risk of, you know, snapping your shit up than you are trying to balance these weird, wonky kettlebells. Now, with that being said, there are some movements that I do like the kettlebells for. Like, uh, I like using kettlebells for, um, for farmer's walks. Like, we got some heavy kettlebells at the gym now, and for, for farmer's walks, I find them great. If you're doing the kettlebell swings, I find those are great. So yeah, there's certain things I do like the kettlebells for, but for most things, like if, if I'm going to do a, a bicep curl, I don't want to do a kettlebell bicep curl. I want to do a dumbbell curl because the kettlebell is just going to be, you know, bending up against your wrist and your forearm. And it's just going to be this awkward, uncomfortable thing. <laughs> right. So, you know, 
they are a tool. It's just another tool in the toolbox, but there's nothing special about a freaking kettlebell. And if I had a choice, if I had to choose one or the other, I go with a dumbbell every, every time. But anyway, um, if that's all you have available, if you have kettlebells available and you want to do it for a kettlebell workout, then you, hey, go for it. Do it. I mean, so again, something's better than nothing. But personally, I think you'd be better off with a dumbbell routine for most of the exercises anyway, especially pressing exercises. Pulling ones really don't matter that much. Like if you're doing a kettlebell row versus a dumbbell row, it's there's not a lot of difference. Um, but for pressing exercises and stuff like that, curls, lateral raises, you know, flies, all, I think dumbbells are far superior. They're just more practical and, and more well-balanced and less awkward to lift. But anyway, and, and then, of course, the best scenario is to actually go to a well-equipped gym where you have barbells and dumbbells and machines and then the whole shebang. That would be your best option. And, and the way I like to look at this is I, I get these questions a lot where people are like, how do I build my body with the least amount of stuff possible? Like, how do I build my body with whatever? Like, in this case, like kettlebells or someone says, I only have a set of dumbbells or I only have a set of resistance bands or I only have a soup soup cans. How do I build my body curling soup cans? Think of like if somebody is trying to build a house, like a carpenter, contractors coming in and they want, well, how can I build a house and all I have is a hammer and a screwdriver? That's all I have, but I want to build a house. Well, you're pretty limited to what you can do with the hammer and a screwdriver. But if you have all the tools required, you can build a damn nice house or damn nice whatever it is. Just like a carpenter or a contractor or someone needs to have the right tools to get the job done. You need to have the right tools to build your body and trying to build your body with less optimal tools is like someone trying to build a house with a hammer and a screwdriver, right? You're, you're, <laughs> you're putting yourself at a disadvantage right from the start. Like it's hard enough to build a, a, an impressive physique. If you have all the tools available of a well-equipped commercial gym and uh, let alone putting yourself at a disadvantage right from the start from having subpar tools. So like either invest in a good quality home gym or join a commercial gym. Right. That, that's your two options. And and these days, unless you live somewhere in like Timbuktu out in the boonies, commercial gyms are more plentiful than ever. And there is even these bargain commercial gyms like the, the Planet Fitnesses and the Fit for Lesses and these gyms that, you know, for for less than a dollar a day, you're basically have a gym membership. So like it, sh it should not be an issue. You know that that's anyway, that that's my two cents worth and rant of the day. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, but where are Steve is joining in. Steve Gilbert says, I tried the decline fly before and it's pretty awkward. I felt like an idiot and felt like I was doing it wrong. Uh, haven't done it since. <laughs> you're, you're not an idiot and you may not have been doing it wrong, but it's just so freaking awkward to get into a decline bench fly position by yourself, especially if you're lifting appreciable weights. Like if, if you're lifting five pound dumbbells, okay, you probably get in there and do your fly, no problem. But if you're lifting, 40s or 50s or more man that's hard because now you have to hold that weight get in position do your exercise and then you know do a decline bench sit up with that weight yeah it's just it's awkward right it really is uh christian's joining in hello lee and the group hopefully everyone's doing well we are doing well thanks for joining christian we have Rob joining in, started doing drop sets of incline bench press at the end of my workouts. I start at 30 pound dumbbells, go to failure, then 20s, 20s, 15s, 10s, great pump, but looks funny, but great gain. Um, I don't know if there's a follow-up to that or whatever, but there's nothing wrong with doing drop sets. The only issue with uh, drop sets with dumbbells is there's a lot of energy used in switching because obviously... With the dumbbells, you have to get out of position, go to the dumbbell rack, re-rack them, get the next set, come back, get in position again, and do your set again. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a lot of energy wasted in the transition of the drop sets with dumbbells. Whereas if you were doing, say, like a chest press machine with a weight stack, right, you could rep out to failure with your chest press machine and then just drop the pin to the next one. Don't even need to get off the machine. Drop the pin, boom, bang out your next set, drop the pin, do the next set. Or if you're doing um, even barbell presses and doing a drop set there, uh, especially if you have a training partner, uh, you know, they could get the training partner to strip the weights for you so you can keep going more efficiently. That's 
again, that, that's just nitpicky on the details. But like I say, if, if you're enjoying it, you're getting a great pump and, and it's working for you, there's nothing wrong with doing drop sets with dumbbells as well. But it is just more more transition and more mucking around in between each set, right? Because, again, you have to get up, right, re-rack the dumbbells, get the next set, get back in position again for the next set. Yeah, But, hey, if it's working for you, you're enjoying it, you're seeing gains, keep doing it, right? <laughs> Usually for myself, when I'm doing drop sets, I, I like to save it for exercises that are conducive to drop sets. So like weight stack machines are very easy to do drop sets with. And that's what I'll very often do them. Uh, we even at, at Omega Health and Fitness, the gym that I train at, they got these drop set, drop set pins where you can load up the, the weight stack with multiple pins. And it's, it's really cool. I'll probably have to get a video and just like do a, a reel or something to show you how it works. But the way it works is you load up multiple pins into the stack and then you do your set with one set. And then as soon as you, you let the weight plates touch it, literally there's a spring on, on the pin and it shoots the pin out of the weight stack. So it drops it automatically to the next, uh, next pin. So you have automatic drop sets built in. So like you could be doing say like tricep push downs or lat pull downs or whatever. And you could just rep out, rep out, rep out, and then just let the weight plates touch and as soon as the weight stack touches, it spits out the pin and it goes to the next one. And you continue on your set and then you let it touch, spits out that pin and goes to the next one. <laughs> it's really cool. It's one you'll have to see to uh, to appreciate. But uh, we, we have them at the gym there and they're pretty darn cool. I've used them for a few workouts and it's just like a little spring that just shoots the pin out when the weight stack plates touch. Now, the only thing is you got to be careful that you don't accidentally touch the plates in between reps that unintentionally or else you're going to drop the the weight but uh it's a it's a pretty cool setup however they uh i, I can't remember the name of them now i have to i have to check them out next time i'm at the gym but it was a pretty cool feature for sure for doing drop sets but even if you have to manually change the pin it's it's not a big switch right it's still a very quick drop set nonetheless all right folks i think that's all the questions that came through on my end at least it looks like it is. So I'm going to get ready and clue it up because we've been going for over an hour and 20 minutes, right? I always promise an hour and I usually over deliver. <laughs> but nonetheless, I had a great chat and thank you so much for joining in. It's always nice to have a good turnout and some good questions coming through. And if you found this helpful, please smash that thumbs up button or the heart button or whatever button it is on your end. If you're watching on YouTube, it's a thumbs up. If you're on Facebook, you can give it a heart or a like or whatever. And uh, subscribe to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. And that would certainly help. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or you want any help with anything regarding your training, your nutrition, or whatnot, feel free to reach out to me. You can message me through down in my email or through my Facebook Messenger. And if you'd like to keep the conversation going throughout the week, feel free to join us over on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook group. I've got a, a group over there. Uh, just do a search for Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding on Facebook, and you can request to join the group, and I can add you there, and you can be part of our online Facebook community and keep the conversation going throughout the week. All right, guys, I'm going to clue it up. Have yourself a fantastic weekend, and I'll look forward to talking to you next week. Same time, same place. Take care. Over and out.